Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to Spring Meets Gemfire Meets Native. Uh, I'm Udo Kalmeyer. I'm a staff one engineer at VMware, working on the Spring project integration with VMware Gemfire. On my left is John Martin. He is the product manager for the team. And to my right is Patrick Johnson, also another team member. So we just got the legal disclaimer that we have to be aware of. So we've got a second display over here. This is ours, which goes and says all the testing and all the performance numbers you'll be seeing over here are all in relation to the application that we're going to demo today and work with. So, of course, mileage may vary with everybody else, so just take it where it comes from. So our agenda is that we're going to start off with a traditional web application architecture. We'll then move on to how do we increase the performance of something like this. And then finally, we'll be talking about Spring Native and VMware Gemfire and how that helps us. So I want to start with a story, which is June 2023. I'm in my hometown in Australia. And I come down from my home office, and I walk downstairs, and I see my wife and my two daughters sitting at the kitchen table. Both have the, Everybody has their laptop open, the iPad going, the phone going. And when I asked them what's happening, they're saying, no, they're going to buy tickets. I said, what tickets are you going to buy? No, we're going to buy the Taylor Swift tickets, the latest era concert. As it got into sort of an hour before, everybody was starting to very anxiously refresh their monitors or refresh their apps. And when they're going, saying, OK, make sure that in the queue, make sure they get everything else going. And eventually, 10 o'clock comes around. And now this is go time. Everybody's going to buy tickets now. And they're still sitting and staring at their screens, waiting to move from the queue into buying tickets. After about 30 minutes, there's some movement happening on the screens. And people get it, and they start getting into buying tickets. And well, at that point, all the good tickets are gone. There's only one or two tickets left, and they're not really good. So big disappointment for us. But at that time, you start to see social media taking off. And everybody is either posting how they got happy and they got lucky and they got their tickets, but predominantly you start seeing, I never got out of the queue screen. Or I got out of the queue screen, I was about to buy my tickets, and then it either crashed or it froze, and I had to refresh, and I lost my tickets. So looking at this from a, my IT perspective, I looked at this and said, well, very simply, the systems that we were connecting to were just completely overwhelmed by the numbers that we started seeing. And this isn't an isolated case. There are more incidents that come up when you look for this than what you'd be aware of. First one being, or the latest one that I found is 2022, the US Ticketmaster was trying to sell the Taylor Swift, Taylor Swift Eros concert, and they had over three and a half million fans or people register as verified fans, that system went offline really quickly and Ticketmaster issued a comment stating they note they recorded 14 million people or users trying to connect to get tickets. Before this 2022, we got Coinbase. Coinbase put a Super Bowl ad out saying everybody who registers get $15 Bitcoin. Also, within about two hours, the system just couldn't handle it and they had to put a website up saying, sorry, we're working on the problem, we'll get back to you. Same thing with Public Health Ontario in 2020 for the COVID test results. Didn't take long for the system to win, it came online to be taken down because it's just too slow. University of Cambridge releases Stephen Hawking's thesis paper. It crashed the publication site within the first three hours, and they noted that Within the first week, they had 2 million downloads of the, of the paper and 800,000 unique IP visits within the first week. In 2013, we have healthcare.gov. They were up for, tw for two hours and they went down line. And they said they received 
250,000 users trying to access the site. That was five times more than what they had estimated and predicted. And finally, in our example, is Group One. Group One happened to be what, when I was in the field doing consulting work, we spoke about the Oprah moment. And the Oprah moment was when Oprah mentions you on, this, on her show, people are going to visit your site. Group One did not expect to get the load and volumes that they get, and they went offline as well. So why does this continue happening? Looking at it from the outside, I come down to four sort of key areas where this goes wrong. The first one is unplanned and underestimated demand. In cases like healthcare.gov, they estimated five times less than what the site actually got. Group One got completely inundated with unplanned load that they didn't expect to see. Take the next step, which is the cost of idle infrastructure. Well, the cost of idle infrastructure comes down to even if you're capable of estimating what the load or the initial load is going to be, from experience and from speaking to different customers, that's generally 1% to 5% of your total running time is ever at that peak time. The rest of the time, it's way all below that. And all that idle infrastructure is going to cost you money. So generally, we don't scale to that level because it's going to cost us money. The next one is scaling complexity. And scaling complexity comes down to, two th uh, comes down to really the scenario of Understanding and scaling complexity takes a lot of time, planning, architecture, implementing, and testing. So very often you don't get staff or people that know how to do scaling properly, or even spend the right amount of time, or even estimating your scale. So it's really complex. It's one of these dark arts that you sometimes get right, and very often you don't. And finally, it's time. And time is always a factor in every equation. It takes time to implement and time to test scalability. The old version of saying time is money is very true in this situation. And 90% of the time, there's a limit, limit on budget and limit on time you have to deliver something for you to be able to do this. And you're inevitably going to cut, something's going to fall short and you're not going to get it right. So we're going to look at the sort of traditional, traditional architecture of applications, which we used to. This is a standard sort of three-layer kind of architecture. We have a front end, generally written in some web framework like Angular, Vue, or React. We have a service layer written in either Spring, JTEE, Microsoft, C Sharp, anything that sort of extends or exposes a REST interface. And then finally, you have your database or your data store. That could be a Postgres, a Microsoft, Microsoft SQL, an Oracle, whatever. It's just where you want to store your data. You have to get hold of that. So for our talk today, we decided we're going to come up or provide a simple, an overly simplified e-commerce application, which we're going to work through and try and explain how to improve certain steps and how to work and make it better. So ours is running on a simplified front end with Angular. We have a Spring Boot, a Spring Web REST, and Spring Data JPA backend or service layer. Our database or system of record is going to be Postgres. And all of this is going to be running on VMware Tanzu Kubernetes grid. And we're going to monitor this with VMware ARIA operations for applications. Patrick, do you want to just take us through this and show us what we have so far on CodeWise? Sure thing. So the first thing I'm going to do here, uh, we already have this application that Udo just described. Uh, running in our Kubernetes cluster, in Tanzu Kubernetes grid. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to kick off a load generator. So for this, we're using JMeter, and we are simulating 300 simultaneous users, all trying to place an order at the same time. Um, so we're starting this now so that we can get some numbers a little bit later in the presentation. The way that our backend is configured right now, uh, we're starting out with three replicas, so there will be three instances of our service layer in Kubernetes, uh, and then that will scale when we hit a CPU threshold of 60%. So now I'm going to show you the front end of our application. This is our Angular front end. As you can see, it's very simple. I think I'll add a TV, game console, and a couch to my cart. 
I'll go to checkout and I'll pay. So this is just generated an order uh, that'll be stored, it'll be sent to our backend and stored into Postgres. Now for the code. So this is our main Spring Boot application class. As you can see, it's pretty simple. We have this runner here that goes and adds a bunch of products. These are the, these are the ones that you saw just a few moments ago in our Angular front end. And then we have a couple of controllers. So we have this product controller. It's very simple. All it does is sends the list of products that we'd pre-populated in the application uh, so that we can populate our front end. And then we have our order controller where we're able to uh, create and then retrieve orders in our application. We have some domain classes over here. We have a product uh, that is mapped to our product table. It's got an ID, a name, a price, and a picture URL for those pictures that you saw on our front end. We also have an order type mapped to our orders table. It's got an ID, a date that it was created, order status, and then a list of these order products. So order products are just a representation of, um, of the mapping table that we have between the orders and the products table. Um, because we need some way to keep track of what products are in the order and how many of them there are. So here we just have a composite key. That's going to be essentially composed of the product and the order, and then we have an integer quantity. Now for each of these domain types, each of these tables, uh, we have a spring data repository. So we have an order product repository, an order repository, and a product repository. And then each of those have a service and service implementation. So now that you've seen what we're doing, uh, let's go look and see how that load generator is going. Right now, on average, we've been handling just over 1,700 orders per second. So that's not too bad. And now, let's go to our ARIA dashboard. This will allow us to see, um, this will allow us to see the connections, what's going on in our Postgres cluster. So you can see right here, we have a max connections of 100. So 100 is the default maximum and recommended maximum connections for a Postgres cluster. And then backends here represents how many active connections we have talking to our service layer. So we have 98 here, which is basically maxed out because two connections are reserved here. So it's using all of the connections that are available to it. Now if we go look in K9s, this just allows us to visualize the pods in our cluster. As you can see, it's attempting to have, see we have 10 here, one of these pods is our JMeter instance that's uh, generating load. So it's attempting to have nine pods. But as you can see, a few of these are crashing. And the reason for that is because we've already maxed out the number of connections that Postgres can support. So we're not able to start up any more instances. We're not able to scale our backend um, because we're limited by Postgres. Thank you, Patrick. So what we can see over here is, whoa, that's very loud. Um, the traditional architecture has a little bit of a flaw. And the biggest flaw that I can call out over here is that, well, the database couldn't scale. Even though the front end could scale and our service layer scale to multiple instances talking to the back end, we still got a bottleneck on the database. We got to that 98, we couldn't go anymore. So even with adding new technologies like caching, um, all the operations eventually will start suffering when the max number of connections are hit. It doesn't matter how much more we scale the service layer, we're never going to get past that certain layer. And the second one really is has got to do with that. The traditional databases are mostly optimized for batch and bulk operations. In this situation, we have a high volume of small transactional operations which these databases aren't made to handle. So what we really need is a technology that helps us working with high amounts of transactional data and is able to scale at the load as the load is increased. And I'm going to ask John to come over here and talk to us on a possible solution to help us, or technology to help us with this. Thanks, Udo. So let's talk a little bit about VMware Gemfire. 
So VMware Gemfire is an enterprise-grade in-memory database. Through its distributed architecture, Gemfire can respond to large volumes of concurrent requests while maintaining low latency and high throughput. And this makes it an exceptional option for high-performance, real-time applications. It can deliver sub-millisecond response times at scale across multiple data centers. So today we're going to briefly go over some of the Gemfire capabilities. And this won't be an exhaustive deep dive into everything that Gemfire can do. Um, but we do have questions, time for questions at the end if you have more interest. So Gemfire stores data in what we call a region. You can think of a region as being analogous to a SQL table. So for example, here we have two regions, one called students and one called courses. A region is actually a named concurrent map that holds key value pairs. Those key value pairs can be objects. And this gives Gemfire the ability to store things like unstructured data, complex, complex objects, and JSON documents. That data is then sharded across the cluster for horizontal scaling. So a Gemfire cluster has two main components, a locator and a server. The locator is responsible for cluster discovery and configuration. It gives server connection information to clients, and it load balances the servers. The cache server stores the region data in memory. It interacts with client applications to perform data operations and then send back the responses. The, the cache server is also responsible for distributing data across the distributed system to the other members. The servers can also be configured to provide high availability. So if one server goes down, clients can automatically fail over to, other, to another available server. And this ensures continuous access to the region data. A Gemfire cluster can be up to 100 times faster than a traditional database. And it does this because it stores and retrieves the data in memory as opposed to on disk. However, Gemfire does have the ability to optionally store data to disk, making that data more durable for things like disaster recovery. This image shows a cluster of Gemfire with three servers, with each server being represented by a CPU, some memory, and disk. The striped colors represent data being sharded across each server allowing us to easily horizontally scale. So as the amount of data increases or decreases, we can simply add or remove a server to the cluster without interruption of service or data loss. Gemfire can also connect clusters across geographically distributed data centers. So our customers use Gemfire's multi-geo replication capabilities, such as cross data center, multi-data center, within a data center for active-active configuration. For disaster recovery, Users deploy Gemfire across sites in an active-passive setup. Gemfire can even help implement rack awareness for deployment within data centers within multiple availability zones. And where can you run Gemfire? Anywhere you need to. Gemfire supports running clusters across VMware platforms on Kubernetes. You can run it in the public cloud. You can run it on your own private cloud or a hybrid of those two. And you can run it on bare metal. This versatility, along with Gemfire's high performance, enables a wide range of customers' use cases across a diverse set of industries. So for example, in the travel industry, we have airline and railway customers that are using Gemfire for their ticketing applications. Some of these applications are serving 23 million passengers per day in over 10,000 transactions per minute. In the financial industry, we have customers using it for credit card fraud detection. So they'll use Gemfire in their decision management platforms that service over 1 billion financial transactions a day with a latency of less than 2 milliseconds. In healthcare, we have customers that are modernizing their legacy systems, using Gemfire to store policy data, procedure data, and member data, all of which get access many times a day. And we have utility companies that offer near real-time outage updates for more than 1.5 million customers. Now, these customers typically utilize one or more of, the, of these common data storage patterns. So there's the system of record, and this is where Gemfire is the source of truth, with no database backing it. This pattern typically involves Gemfire persisting data to disk for additional durability. There's the cache aside pattern, and this is where the application checks Gemfire for the value. If the value doesn't exist, then the, database, then the application retrieves the value from the database and puts it into Gemfire for the next time it needs it. There's the read-through, write-through pattern, and this is where Gemfire sits between the application and the database. And the application treats Gemfire as the main data store 
and reads and writes data to it. And then Gemfire synchronously reads and writes that data to the database. There's the write behind pattern, and this is very similar to the write through pattern, but in this instance, the write to the database is asynchronous. So the puts are written to the database in batches at a later time. And we have the refresh ahead or a hot cache. This is where Gemfire sits between the application and the database, but the database preloads the data into Gemfire. This allows all reads for the application to be satisfied by Gemfire. And we can't have a Spring 1 talk without mentioning our Spring compatibility. So we currently have three main Spring libraries that are compatible with Gemfire. There's Spring Data for VMware Gemfire, which brings the power of Spring Data to your Gemfire applications. There's Spring Boot for Gemfire, and this offers a streamlined and efficient way to integrate Spring Boot's powerful auto configuration and rapid development benefits with Gemfire. And then we have Spring Session for Gemfire which allows Gemfire users to leverage the Spring Session framework to manage user session information. So now that you know a little bit about Gemfire, we're gonna walk through another demo. And in this demo, Patrick's gonna replace Spring Data JPA with Spring Data Gemfire, and we'll replace Postgres with Gemfire as the backing store. Patrick? Sorry. Okay, I'm gonna start this demo very similarly to how I started the last demo by kicking off essentially the same load test. It's still going to be JMeter simulating 300 simultaneous users. We'll have the same scaling policy, once again, starting with three instances of the back end. Okay, and while that's running, I'll show you how we can go change, uh, how we can go change this application to use Gemfire instead of JPA. So our first step is that we're going to replace Spring Boot Starter Data JPA with Spring Data for Gemfire. So there's gonna be com, VMware, Gemfire, Spring Data 3.1, that's a version of Spring Data that we're using, Gemfire 10.0, and then this is currently version 1.0.0. We're going to leave, leave Spring Boot Starter Web alone because we're still going to be using the same REST controllers. And then we'll re be replacing Postgres with Gemfire Core. So that's com, VMware, Gemfire again, and Gemfire Core. And this is going to be version 10.0.0 that we'll be using today. Now, because Gemfire is a commercial product, it's not available in Maven Central. So we're going to have to add a commercial Maven repository to be able to resolve those artifacts. That should look something like this. I already have my credentials configured in my Gradle settings. I'm going to go and refresh my Gradle, and we'll get into some of the code changes. So first, in our main application, we're going to add some new annotations. We're going to add client cache application, which tells Spring that this is going to be a Gemfire client app. We're also going to enable Gemfire repositories so that we can use the Spring repository abstraction to access data from our Gemfire cluster. And as a development time convenience, I'm going to enable cluster configuration, which will allow us to push configuration from our application here up to our Gemfire server so that we don't have to configure things like regions separately. We can just configure them here. And I'll get back to regions in just a second. So I'm gonna have this use HTTP. And while you probably wouldn't do this in production, I'm going to not require HTTPS, just to simplify this demo. Now we need to go define our regions. So we're going to define a couple of client cache, or um, client region factory beans uh, that will define our regions locally, and then that cluster configuration will push that up to the server. You can think of a region like a SQL table. It's where we store our data, except rather than being rows and columns, it's essentially a key value map structure. So first, we need a product region. It'll look like this. And I will give us the necessary imports. And we're also going to need an orders region, like this, to store our orders as we create them. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna make some changes to a few of our domain objects. So in product, we can eliminate a lot of these annotations. 
Because we don't need to be mapped to a table, we don't need to be entities anymore, we don't need this Java X persistence stuff. We will still need an ID. We will not need this. And otherwise, this is left the same. We're also going to go change our order object. Uh, once again, we're not going to need most of these annotations. But while I'm here, I'm going to change our ID. So previously, we'd been using the a numeric ID that was generated by Postgres when we insert data. Um, Gemfire does not do that. We're going to have to create our own key. So we're going to use a UID stored as a string as our ID. So I'm going to change this from a long to a string. I'm going to still remove this annotation to get down to it. I'm going to remove this annotation as well. I'm going to re-import transient because it needs to be here. And then because I changed that ID type, I'm going to need to change a couple of these methods down here where we're getting and setting the ID. And those are all the changes that should be necessary. Now we're going to go to order product. This class is going to get significantly simplified because if you'll notice when we created regions, we did not create an order product region the same way we had an order product table. That's because since we're not a relational database, we don't need to have a mapping table between orders and products. We can just store our order object we'll, that will contain the order products that it needs. So we're still going to use this class, but it's not going to have its own region that's specifically um, persisting these objects separately. Um, so when you're done, the class will look like this. So we've removed that key, that complex key entirely. Um, we just have a product and a quantity. And that's all that we need to have in here. And because we were able to remove that key, we can remove this entire class. We don't need it anymore. And we also don't need the repository because we won't be persisting these to a region specifically. And then we can also remove the order product service and the order product service implementation. The next changes that we're going to make are going to be in our controller. So we still have an order product service here that we can get rid of. We don't need it. And we don't need it in our constructor either. Here in our create method, this is where we're actually creating the orders. We can remove the order product services create. We're still going to be creating a product order, but we aren't going to be saving it to a repository, and we don't need to pass in order anymore because order product will just be contained by the order class. We don't need to have a mapping to the other table. And as I said, we, we are going to have a UID used as the ID. So right here, after we create our order, we're going to set the ID to UUID, random UUID ID, and then we're going to save that as a string. The other thing that we can change here, you'll see this logic where we, using the order service, save our order, and then we go through this logic of adding these order products to our order and then updating it down here at the bottom. So this was necessary because of our mapping table, but because Gemfire is an object store, we don't need to do this anymore. We can just do a single operation. So instead of creating it here and then updating it, we can just remove that, and then where we had been updating it before, we can just create it. We can just do one operation to do all of that work. And these should be all the code changes that you'll need to change your app over to using Gemfire. Most of these spring abstractions still hold, so you're still going to have repositories. Not much is going to change there. So let's get back to that load test that I kicked off earlier. So it looks like currently we're handling a little over 3,400 uh, operations, 3,400 orders per second. So that's about twice what we were seeing before. So that's, that's pretty good. Now, let's go back to our ARIA dashboard where we saw the Postgres connections capping out at 98 of their maximum 100. So these are the connections we have now. We have three servers, and across those three servers, we are handling several hundred. This is, what, 800 or uh, 700 connections approximately? Um, and we could scale to more. So we don't have a hard limit the same way that we did with our uh, JPA database. 
Now, another thing that I'm going to show you, we're going to go into canines where we can see our cluster. And we're going to go look at the logs to see how long or how quickly this started up because this is going to come in handy later. So let's remember this number that this application started in just over five seconds. Like I say, that's going to come in handy later, so remember that part. Thank you, Patrick. Um, as Patrick showed, just introducing Gemfire, the application was able to handle significant or significantly more transactions or simultaneous transactions than before. Currently, in our demonstration, we only have three Gemfire servers deployed. And we can scale that to higher numbers and bigger numbers. Um, in practice, we have seen deployments spanning 40 to 50 servers. Um, and each of them, or in total, holding about three terabytes worth of data in memory. With sub-second response times, in many cases, most of, the, most of them are, 100, are under 100 milliseconds. Whilst all of this seems fairly impressive, there's still more room for improvement here. And we can definitely have a look at this. So the one thing we can look at is, we spoke about an increased service layer, how that grows with time. And in our testing, for numbers we'll show later on in the demonstration, we saw that the service layer instances grew to around 30 service instances or more. Whilst these extra instances require uh, are required, they re generally require more RAM and more resources. And once again, generally this is only for one to five percent of our total running time of the system. If we were to be able to predict when these peaks would occur, we could spin them up manually and we'd be okay, but we can't. So we'd either have to have them running all the time, and that is an increased cost to the user. In the last year, the notion of scale to zero became popular. And scale to zero effectively means that when the system is under no load, the system scales down to zero instances running. Um, and these are generally happening on off-peak times like evenings or weekends when the system isn't running or people aren't logged in. And when load is detected, the system just spins up an instance for it to work. But in order for it to scale to zero to effectively work, we need to be able to spin up these instances really quickly and instantaneously would be preferred. Now Kubernetes, the basic flavor of Kubernetes does not support scale to zero, but you could use Knative or Keda as libraries that can help you scale services down to zero. Which brings us to I say, I would say a fairly recent technology, Java technology, but it's been around for a few years, but it's become popular now. And it's called Java Native. And Java Native instances are standalone, ahead of, ahead of time, statically compiled binary executables of your Java code. These Java Native applications are generally better suited for cloud environments um, uh, because they are standalone executables. And all the major cloud providers, Oracle, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, vSphere, all of them start supporting these. They are compact, they are easy to run because they are single executable, and they are completely immutable. And because they are completely immutable, they are also more secure. And one of the reasons why they are more secure is because ahead of time compilation traces all the paths that your code will go through in your code path and only compile that code into the executable. This means that the standard feature we know from Java is where we can load things at runtime into the system completely goes away because our system becomes completely static and standalone and nothing ha can happen at runtime anymore. Which is quite good because you know exactly what's going to be in your system and no malicious things can be compiled or loaded in at runtime. Another benefit is that it uses less resources. Because it doesn't, have to it doesn't drag everything into the runtime anymore, it only brings your code that is required, it uses a lot less resources, memory specifically. 
And it, one of the main features that we'll see is that it has incredibly fast startup times. We're talking milliseconds compared to seconds. Now, with all the good comes some of the bad. There are restrictions in this. The one thing is that ahead of time compilation means the system has no knowledge of what's happening. It just goes and says, I'm going to compile everything the same. Whereas JIT, which is the normal Java, has the ability at runtime to understand what the hot path is and optimize it as best it can. A native application is also slower. Um, now, the enterprise version of GraalVM allows you to provide extra capability to make it faster, but generally just a standard native image will be slower when it runs over time than a JIT compiled one, just specifically because it has no knowledge of what the hot path is, what it can optimize. Issue resolution becomes a bit of a pain sometimes because in order for ahead of time compilation to work effectively, everything that Java does at runtime dynamically, be it reflection, serialization, JNI lookups, that has to be provided upfront to the compiler. Which means when you run into issues sometimes, you need to try and understand, did I miss putting one of these hints into the, into the files that the compiler uses for it to know that this code path actually exists and actually works correctly? Or is it my code base that actually has gone wrong? So it makes it a little more tricky to understand sometimes to find a problem because you first have to understand if you got it correctly set up. Um, another one is a possible reduction in language features. As I mentioned, because it's completely static, everything needs to be known up front, everything needs to be compiled in. Nothing can happen at runtime anymore, sort of dynamically loaded anymore. So that goes away. So things like reflection, serialization, as I said, JNI, all of that has to be provided up front, otherwise it doesn't work. And also loading classes at runtime, even with like a class for name, if you haven't got that, that thing uh, configured in your hint file that you have to provide to the, uh, to gr the Graal VM compiler, it wouldn't know how to do that. But finally, the biggest one is compilation time. We've gone back to this one. I thought we lost, we always lost it and we thought we went away from it, but we've gone back to this. This simple little spring application we have over here takes anywhere between 10 and 15 minutes to compile. So you have to take this into account. It actually takes a lot of time to compile this sometimes. But, you know, Spring will not be Spring if they try and make things life easier for you, and Graal and Spring, they are a perfect match in heaven. So in order to build a native image just using Graal VM, as I said, you have to have these native uh, image hint files that you have to provide. And generally, there's two ways of getting them. Either A, you know how to write them, they're just a JSON document, and Patrick will later on show just an example of what they look like, and you have to build it up. Or you can run your application using a Graal VM's tracing agent. And then you have to go and exercise every code path that your application will use, and the tracing agent will then create these hint files for you. That's pretty good and everything else, but it is an extra step in your whole process of doing this. Whereas Spring is gone, and they have written an, a Spring AOT library which you now include into the project. And the Spring AOT library has a pre-compiler, pre not pre a pre-processor, sorry, that will go through your Spring code and generate all the hint files for you that your code has. So it will follow all the code parts for you and make sure those hint files get put into the system for you and correctly set up. Not only have they provided that AOT pre-processor, they also have plugins for both Gradle and Maven that allow you to build this thing without a problem. And they've also gone and given you the ability to use build packs to build a native image and push it up to Docker for you. For you. So it makes it a simple step. They've also got testing support for your native code. So you can use your existing tests that you have and you can test your code as it is in your normal Java world and then you can go and say certain tests, I want them to run a native mode. And it will actually test that code for you and will make sure that the native image is built 
and is pushed in there and made available for testing. Now, coming back to the libraries that John spoke about, the Spring VMware Gemfile libraries, we have these as well. Right now, we have some limitations. Um, both the Spring Boot and the Spring Data are not AOT, don't support AOT at this point right now, Spring AOT like right now. Um, we're in the process of amending that, and we'll hopefully get a release out that will actually provide that capability and be supporting AOT. Um, another one which is actually not really something we can control, but Gemfire uses Log4j for logging, and Log4j is not native compilable. So <laughs> we're at ransom by some other library right now that's holding it. So we'll have to see if we can get that resolved as well. And finally, we have these extra nice annotations like entity-defined regions or enable PDX, and those don't work as well or, or can't be used right now, just for the simple reason that these are in the dynamic space. They are things that look at your domain objects and determine what region needs to go into, or what does the structure of the object look like so it knows how to serialize it using the PDX, uh, Gemfire PDX serializer. As I said, all of these are in process. We are in the process of looking at that and trying to get them resolved. But the one thing that Spring will provide you is still the ability to run the tracing agent to generate those hints files. So if you use this, you can still use it, the, the tracing agent and you can build your Spring application using native technology. Now we're going to get to our final demo, which is we're going to take the app we have right now and we're going to make it native compilable. And Patrick will show us how to do that. Thank you, Udo. So by this point, you can probably guess how I'm going to start this demo. That's right, by starting our load generator again. And while that's warming up to give us some numbers, I'll show you what you need to do in order to get this app running using Spring Native. It's actually pretty simple. There aren't any code changes that you're going to need to make here. It's all going to be Gradle stuff. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add the Grawl plugin, which enables native support in Spring. So it looks like that. The next thing that we're going to need to do, we're going to need to add a couple of exclusions here. Uh, we're going to need to exclude commons logging because unfortunately there's a fatal conflict between commons logging and spring JCL. So to avoid that, we just need to do exclude module commons logging. And we're going to do that both here from the spring data gemfire dependency and then also down below from gemfire core itself as they both bring in commons logging. Uh, the next thing that we're going to need to do, which is a side effect of the way that we are building this native image, uh, is add container support. So the way that we're going to be building this native image is uh, by using Docker. This basically saves us from having to download and set up the Graal VM on our machine. Um, so it just allows a little more flexibility. But in order to do that, we're going to need to enable container support, which can be done like this, by basically just adding this configuration to boot build image. And those are all the changes that we're going to have to make here. The next thing that you need to uh, consider is those hint files that Udo talked about earlier. Unfortunately, Spring Data Gemfire is not currently uh, AOT compliant, so we're going to have to generate those hint files ourselves. They're going to live here in this directory under resources. I'll show you what one of them looks like just for an example. It's a JSON file, just like Udo had described. So something you probably don't want to hand roll yourself, so it's good that we have a way to generate these. They can be generated with this line here. So see, we're setting this native image agent to run, um, to run with our jar. And that'll generate these hint files for you. So this would basically start your, com your application up in command line, uh, and then you can just go exercise whatever code paths you need to uh, for it to go through and gather the runtime information that the Graal VM is going to need at compile time. I'm not going to run this right now since, as with all these other demos, we already have a pre-baked, um, we already have a pre-baked executable. We already have a native image that's running in TKG that's currently being put under load. So I'm not going to run and show you how to exercise this, but this is how you would go and generate these files when you get to that point.
And now once you have that, you're ready to build your image, which you can build with this boot build image command. As I said, we're going to be using Docker, so you'll need to have Docker desktop running on your machine for this to work. Uh, it is possible to build native images without Docker, but that will require that you download and install the Graal VM. So it's just a little bit of a different process. I'm going to kick this off right now. Um, as you can see, it's starting to process stuff, but I'm not going to let this run all the way through because, as Udo said, this could take up to 15 minutes. Um, so we're not going to do that in this talk. Oh, <laughs> sorry about that. Live demos, something always goes wrong. This should run for, you know, 10, 15 minutes, something like that. And then you'll have your native image that you can go run or set up in your Kubernetes environment or whatever. So, uh, let's go take a look at that load generator that we had set up. So it looks like currently we're handling. Oh, sorry. Let me make this a little easier to see. So if you look at our load generator, we're currently handling about 5,500 re requests per second right now. So that's actually pretty good. Um, but the real cool part is what I'll show you in just a moment. This is one of the major advantages that Udo talked about. So we're going to go look at the logs for one of these pods to see how long it took to start up. So you see here, the e-commerce application started in 0.151 seconds. Now if you remember before, this was starting in five seconds. So that is a massive improvement. That's like a 25 or more fold improvement. Thank you, Patrick. So now we're going to get to some graphs. Everybody else wants to see these things. So the first graph we're going to show is just startup times. Um, and I just did this on my local, my Apple Mac machine. Same application, everything else. And as you can see, I did 10 runs. And out of the 10 runs, the green bar at the bottom is a native image. It started within 110 to 150 milliseconds each time. The native, the Java app, the non-native app, started anything between 1.9 to 1.6 seconds each time. Now, but as you can see in the container, we were talking five seconds. So it's just hardware that's a little faster and a little different. But it's still, I mean, 100 milliseconds versus close to two seconds. That is significant. The next one is the RSS memory of the application. The native image is about 110 megs in memory. I have not done anything yet, so it's just the application that started up. It's 110 mem megs in memory. In comparison, the Java app is running around 420 megs. We haven't done anything yet. These are just started up and it hasn't done anything yet. 420 megs in memory. So you can see there's a quarter of the size in memory, resident memory. It's quite helpful if you want to get the most out of your hardware and don't have to spend a lot of your stuff on man, RAM. But the coup de grace, the performance numbers. So I ran four tests. One test running this application against the Postgres instance. One test running it using the Java JIT compiled, so the normal Java JVM, which is the yellow line. Then I ran the same test using a native compiled image, which is the purple line. And then, just to help a little bit and show, I used the, Gra uh, the GraalVM Enterprise version and I optimized the Gradle, uh, optimized the native, Im native image. So in order to optimize it, I went and enabled that I can use the G1GC for the native image. Otherwise, it just uses a serial GC. And secondly, you can create profile files. As you run your application, it creates a profile file which tells the compiler what the hot paths are, what piece of your code is actually something you care about and what's important. If you look at the numbers, the Postgres line, the green one at the bottom, it's fairly stable at around 1,400 to 1,000, maybe six or 700 transactions a second. And this is against 
10, 20, 50, 100, 200, 500,000, and 2,000 simultaneous users. Now, I learned something new when I was doing this demonstration because there's a difference between simultaneous and concurrent. And concurrent users are the ones that you see that come onto your website and they just do something. They're either checking something or they're just somewhere else on your site. They're just on your site somewhere. Whereas simultaneous users are the number of users that do the exact same operation at the same time. So to put it in perspective, you can go into your Amazon website, you can have 15, 20, even 50,000 concurrent users doing something, but only have one to two or maybe 3,000 simultaneous users. Because it's the same operation at the same time. So this operation was the put or the post operation we did into the system. So if you look at the performance numbers, the yellow line, the JIT, or the, the normal JIT compiler, the JVM, it ran around, I think, what, 4,500 transactions per second and peaked at around 4,200 a second. Then we take, take the normal, the native one, and that's a little lower. Even though it's faster than the standard, the Postgres one is still a little lower, and as I said before, it is not as fast, it isn't optimized because everything is the same to it. And you can see the numbers are not as spectacular as a JVM. But then you look, if you look at the orange line, you'll see that the native optimized image is about equal to your normal JIT JVM. Now from all documentation, it's within 80 to 90% of your JVM, so even Graal goes and says it's not as fast as your normal JVM, but it is getting close. And they're all working on making it faster and be the similar. But what you get is that millisecond startup times that you can react to. So how does all of this help us? How do we take all of this information and put it back together? So we started with the unplanned and underestimated demand. Well, yes, we will never be able to go and estimate correctly how many users or what our peaks are going to be. We can try and get close, but we'll never get there. But with a system which allows us to scale every layer independently as load requires, we can adapt to that. Unplanned doesn't become a problem anymore because we can scale up. And using native, we can scale up really quickly compared to the normal one. We go back to cost of idle infrastructure. Well, once again, we get to the point that if we have scaled everything up, we can't have it let it run all the time, so we can scale it back down again. With scale to zero, we can effectively get down to the minimum set of instances we require for that, to, for that load peak or that load times. So as I said, off-peak times and weekends and that thing, it can scale down to zero if you ever set it up that way. Scaling complexity, well that suddenly starts becoming a lot simpler. As you can see from the spring code, there were very minimal changes we had to do to make our JPA code go to Gemfire and then become native. So the changes become easy. Running in TKG or Kubernetes allows us the ability to scale up and scale down as required. And also, the complexity of scaling your storage mechanism, your database. Because J VMware Gemfire is made to scale and deal with increasing loads, that is also it goes away and becomes very simple for you to just scale your bottom layer as load requires. And finally, it's time. It's the time you spend on having to change your code. It's the time you spend on having to architect it correctly, make sure and test it to the nth degree. And it's the time that it takes your system to start up. It all just becomes very, very simple. And with that, I'm going to leave you with a parting quote from Benjamin Franklin, which goes and says, by failing to prepare, you're preparing to fail. Do we have any questions? We do not have a community edition for Gemfire. No, we do not. <laughs> Used to be, but we've parted ways and 
we're now developing Gemfire. I mean, Geode still exists, it's still an open source project and everything else, but VMware, and, and uh, we, we're just focusing 100% on Gemfire and we're going to take that product forward. So to repeat the question, what happens is if your Gemfire instance has consumed all the memory that's been allocated to it, and what's going to happen at that point? So there are multiple things we can do at that situation. So it, it once again is like when you set up your Gemfire instance, you set it up in the sense that you can tell it to use uh, eviction, um, which allows you to get to the point that as soon as it gets to a memory threshold, it starts evicting stuff down to disk, because it's to make, you can make it durable, you want to load it back into memory again. So you evict it down to disk, effectively freeing up space so you can do that. Um, so you have an ability to start, it uses the least recently used algorithm, so it just goes and says, oh, everything that isn't hot in the caching state list, we'll start pushing it down to disk and freeing up space so that we keep all the hot data around. It doesn't mean we're losing it, so if you were to still do a key lookup, it will still know, it can still pick it up from file and it can still do it. But there are different ways of configuring it. Um, the second way is, you know what, you get to the point that you say you're going to have to scale. You actually have so much data, you just add another node or one or two more servers because then you get the extra computing power and the extra memory, which allows you to scale it. And because it has the ability to actually have your database sitting behind it as a read through or write through capability, you can still have your legacy database backing this and actually getting the extra power of the system. So those bullets are kind of writing through, it's like it's up to the process that's writing it to the bone stress? Uh, yeah, it's, active, it's effectively it's a asynchronous batch operation that writes it down into this. Oh, that, back to your database, sorry, not to this. So when you when you put something into Gemfire, it will go and say, okay, we need to push this data back to data, back to our legacy database. So it happens in a batch mechanism, which is beneficial for databases, and it doesn't asynchronously, so it doesn't affect the main system. So once again, as I said, we need to make the distinction. Uh, let me just turn this. We need to make the distinction that Gemfire is a high transactional database. It's in, it stands in the OLTP category. So you want to go and use the, the tool that you have for it. So if you have high transactions, use an OLT database, which actually allows you to use that stuff. If you want to do reporting and analytics, unfortunately, relational databases do a lot better at that. That works primarily when you have a cache miss. Meaning you come in and you're looking up a value, it hasn't been loaded into Gemfire before, so it actually goes down to the database, the relational database, and pulls it in. It's, 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 it's a lazy loading kind of principle, if you want to call it that way, but after a while, you're gonna get all your data that you run with your hot data running in your Gemfire instance, and you can start it that way. And eventually, I mean, I've seen cases where users actually have nightly runs where they actually go and upload or populate the data, a gem file from the database to avoid that going down to the database and pulling it back up again every single time. Yes, if you persist, if you have durability or persistence turned on in gem file, it writes it all to local disk. So when the service goes offline, it can re, re, it re reads everything into memory from disk. Does it remember what was in memory? Say, say I have 10 times as much. What was in memory? It does not, no. 
Um, it has equal opportunity at that time for everything to be there. So like anything else, there will be some warm-up period that it will actually start discovering and working out what is hot and what is not. Any other questions? Sorry? Don't fight competitors. Oh. <laughs> I'm not quite sure I'm going to answer that one. <laughs> Redis is a popular alternative if you want to. We have a Redis plugin that allows us to do that. There are other limitations on Redis, but all that information you can find online, and we can definitely, you guys being VMware customers, you can we get in touch with you and we can help you through the process. But yeah, Redis could be a, a, a competitive unit, call it that way. But as I said, they have their, risk, they have risk, they have their limitations and restrictions as well. <laughs> Redis? I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> yes, yeah, so don't get, don't get Redis. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Any other questions? Not? Um, so we'll just move on. Um, here are some other talks on different areas that are, which we'll be working on. Uh, scale to zero of the data products, tens of communities grid. Um, I think some of them are still happening. Some of them happened already. So if they happened already, you can just download or watch them in demand and have a go at them. So these are definitely good talks to go to and have a look at. Um, also, you can reach us on Twitter or X or what Elon wants to call us this week. Um, you can go to LinkedIn, join us there, or you can go to the gemfire.dev website. Um, that's a new website. It has examples, samples, tutorials, help case, test cases, that kind of stuff. So it's definitely worthwhile to go there to learn and get some little bit ideas what's going on. And finally, please feel free to take a survey. Tell us how we did. Tell us if it was good, hot or not. That kind of statement. Thank you very much.